Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. The stock markets were calm after hitting highs last week. He looks at the performance of gold, crude, and the U.S. and Canadian dollars. Founder of ArmstrongEconomics.com, Martin Armstrong, tells us what the real rate of inflation is and comments on government debt, interest rates, digital currencies, gold, and the panic cycle. Longtime BC trader Victor Adair believes the key economic factor we have to keep an eye on is inflation and gives us his take on the greenback, commodities, and the stock markets. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated. Trades on the TSX Venture AMY. On the OTCQB AMYZF. And Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Good to be with you, Jim. Ross, how did the stock markets play out at the end of the week? Well, you know, a week ago, we had some of these challenging the highs of the year. That would be the S&P and the NASDAQ. And what did they do this week? They thrashed around, tested the uh, the lows of the preceding week. And then on Friday, good employment numbers. But then again, those are old employment numbers, aren't they? And the market uh, had a fabulous recovery into Friday. But You know, if we look at it overall, go back a month from now, we're basically the same price levels that we were at that point. So it's a, you know, it's a market that's going through a thrashing process. Um, Big rally into uh, the end of 2021, a correction into mid-year last year, and now just a a lot of sideways. Uh, Very indicative of the the days back in uh, 1999-2000 of the big move, and then uh, uh, the year 2000 into 01, uh, a lot of thrashing around. So we're uh, just going through this process. Um, some, you know, some of the deeply oversold items like the the regional banks um, are bouncing back a bit, but then again, uh, they deserve a bit of a bounce with the the kind of a debacle they've had over there. What's going on with crude? Um, well, you know, crude had that really nice rally up into the low 80s. And then instead of having just a mild correction, where you know, we should have held probably around 74 or 76 dollars, uh, it corrected all the way back down to the lows that we've seen in the last month or so. So, um, you know, typically, if, if you've been in a declining trend, as we have been uh, since uh, May of last year, when we were up at $120, uh, the recovery rallies, you expect to see them back up, and they may be, you know, testing the 20 or the 50-week moving average, and then put in some higher lows as it starts to build a bit of a base. Uh, in this case, uh, two weeks ago at 84, we were up and uh, just kissing the 50-day or the 50-week average. And um, then instead of, as I say, holding reasonably well, we've gone all the way back down to 65 and bounced. But the fact that we've shown that much weakness and we're trying to double bottom, the probability is that this rally is going to have some resistance, about 75 now, and uh, likely go down and um, take out that $65 low that we saw. Now, when I look back at the, the historicals on this, we have maybe five examples of the last uh, uh, three, four decades that are similar to this. And uh, once we go down and maybe take out that low and build a, a decent base, we could be, uh, by the time we get into the summer or the fall, maybe the beginning of a, a multi-year rally. But uh, um, let's uh, we'll take it all a step at a time for right now, as of now. Um, 74 to 75 is the new overhead resistance, and let's see how it does once it gets up there. 
What's going on with gold? Uh, there's one that uh, has uh, been exceptionally good the last couple of weeks. So we got up uh, into that uh, 2060 level on basis the the spot price. Uh, this is right up and challenging the um, the highs of the last uh, year or so, and um, it uh, corrected back on Friday. Probably, you know, getting a little overbought as far as the upside is concerned right now. We still view that 1970 support as really, really important. And uh, so closed off the week now in the, the 20, 30-ish range. Um, and uh, if uh, if it can hold support, that's good. But if anything, it's it's looking heavy enough that uh, I might see a, a little bit of a correct, deeper correction in here than what we've seen recently. And if we look at uh, the uh, silver market, uh, same type of action uh, percentage-wise, it's been a you know a really good move off the bottom. But twenty-six dollars has become a double top in this one right now, uh, with support around uh, twenty-four and a half. So trading range as we speak right now. Uh, but uh, trend is up. Give it a little bit of uh, leeway, and uh, we'll see what it does. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Martin Armstrong, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics, available online at armstrongeconomics.com. He's speaking to us from Florida. Marty, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thank you for inviting me. Last time we spoke, the real rate of inflation in the U.S. was 34%. What do you think is the latest real rate of inflation? Well, it's it's quite amazing that the numbers that they put out, it's all really just, you know, propaganda. I mean, gasoline's up 44%. Airline tickets are up 33%. Used cars are 23%. Hotels are 23%. Uh, men's clothing is up 23%. Bacon's up, you know, almost 20%. Oranges, 17%. And how, so how do we come up with? You know, uh, you know, two percent. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, it, what it is is they put in everything that they can possibly find: paper clips, rubber bands, whatever, to bring down the whole number. So the more stuff you throw in there, the the lower the average becomes, and that's what they do. But the average person, what they're seeing, is still over thirty percent compared to last year. Well, I I think it was back in the 90s, the U.S. and Canadian governments agreed that the official inflation numbers wouldn't include energy or housing because they were too volatile. But without energy and housing, what do you have? No, I know. They took, uh, when there was a real estate boom, they took real estate out and replaced it with rents. Yes. Because they said, oh, well, that's really an investment, (laughs) you know, Um so I guess, you know, if you, you buy a loaf of bread and it's for, you know, a quarter and it goes up to 50%, it's really an investment, you know. And that gallon of gas or liter of gasoline you bought, that's an investment too then. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it doesn't count, you know. it's it, The whole thing is just, you know, I don't know. This is why we, we really, um, I think Trump was elected because one of the things he did say really made sense, you know. Term limits. <laughs> you, know, um, you can't have career politicians. You just can't because it's always going to be them against us then. This week, the Fed again raised its central bank rate by a quarter point. How high would interest rates need to go to get inflation under control? And can just interest rates get this inflation under control? No. I mean, uh, look, I I did post on there. I showed that 
the first rate hike came two weeks after the Ukraine war began. But inflation started going up two years before. So the Fed did not raise rates because it knew the inflation that was unfolding at that time was due to shortages. So high interest rates are not going to do anything to stop shortages. They only make it worse. And raising interest rates at this point is just, you know, really absurd. So, but if you, you look at the Fed statement, it said it would be looking at, you know, inflation, employment, and at the very end, it put in the real issue. It said, and international events. Of course, the Fed can't come out and actually tell the truth and say, look, we're raising rates because you guys are dumping money like it's hand over fist into Ukraine. Um, but war is always the number one driver of inflation. I mean, you know, just look at no matter what war you look at. I mean, even when coins first were developed in Lydia in Turkey, you know, they attacked ba- basically the Persians. And within three years, they had to debase their currency by 25 percent. Um you know, it's you just go throughout history, the Peloponnesian War, Athenian Athens, it, it could no longer produce silver coins because of the inflation. Uh, everywhere you go, I mean, um, <clears throat> the U.S. was bankrupt in 1896. World War I uh, basically bankrupted Britain and made the United States the financial capital of the world. And by the time World War II came, uh, the U.S. had 76% of the world gold reserves, and Europe was bankrupt. Uh, I mean, I don't see what we ever get out of these wars. I mean, um, you know, you just have people that are just, you know, hateful and just want to always get somebody else or whatever. But what's a soldier actually get? I mean, the best the soldier can hope for is that he gets the return home on, you know, in one piece. And with an intact mind. Uh, so do you think the Fed has a target for its uh, interest rate that they think, oh, this will get inflation under control? Or are they not even flying by the seat of their pants, but just flying blind? No, they're not really after the uh, inflation. When he says we're also looking at international events, uh you know, he can't criticize Congress, but the central bank, I mean, a lot of people, you know, blame the, the bankers, but the Fed cannot control the spending, the fiscal side. It can only control the money side. So, but, you know, it used to be in the 60s that if you you went and bought a government bond, you were not allowed to borrow on it. And that's where this theory came you know, up with that it was uh, it was less inflationary to borrow than to spend. But then after Bretton Woods collapsed in 71, um, that is, you can borrow against it. So if you want to trade futures, you post T-bills, okay, that as the collateral. You can trade off of T-bills. All right, so, you know, government debt today is only money that pays interest. That's it. So the central bank can no longer control the money supply because the bulk of it is really being created by governments. Is the money supply being reduced, making lending much more restrictive? Well, you have banks that are reading the, the effectively just the, um, the headlines of, of the fake news and saying, oh, you know, the Fed's going to stop inflation. And so they didn't hedge. That's what SVB Bank was the problem. Um, you know, they've been more interested in woke, uh, hiring people to fill slots to make it look good, but they didn't have the qualifications. Look at most of the people on the, on the board at SVB Bank were there for simply because they had political, you know, contacts. They had no banking experience. I mean, this is this is really a systemic problem. Um, so, I mean, you had the you know the, the spokeswoman for Biden standing up and bragging about how his White House is 
is the is woke and he had seven uh LGBTQ AIDS. I mean, so what if you're straight and and you you don't you're not qualified anymore? Um I mean, I don't know where you would have found seven AIDS like that to begin with, but um you couldn't have one that was just not <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It, it's the whole thing is just getting to be completely crazy, and uh, so the Fed is is incapable of stopping this kind of inflation. Um, a lot of it also has been put on because of the sanctions against Russia, which divided the world economy. So China now is going full speed on their chip system, uh, and you know this is what's going on. I mean, it, they have effectively destroyed the world economy globalism as we've known it uh and so from here on out it doesn't get better it only gets worse how bad could the u.s banking crisis get it, it's this type of of crisis is different than the 08 uh crisis back then it was mainly just the banks that bought their um you know, their mortgage-backed securities. Here we have, effectively, uh, all these banks were uh, had long-term investments, etc. and then when you start raising rates after keeping them artificially low for so long, uh, you end up, uh, you know, they've taken huge losses in their long-term portfolios. But the U.S. Is, isn't anywhere close to as bad as it is in Europe. In Europe, they went negative on government bonds in 2014. So ever since, basically every long-term bond that they have, they have effectively lost anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of it, of its value. Uh, I mean, pension funds, banks. The the real crisis is over in Europe. Are some or all of the banks risky to have your money in? Well, it, you need basically the banks that are more sophisticated, which tends to be the larger banks. Um, you know, at least, you know, they will respond and have a, a, a real management uh, team. I mean, I mean, in all honesty, I've been called into some of the top companies in the world. And, um, one, I mean, I was called into Mercedes. They had heard that the euro was was going to be number one, and effectively that uh, the pound was going to fall because it was not going to be in the euro. So they shorted the pound. Based upon what they read in the newspaper, the pound went up, the euro went down, they lost about a billion dollars, we got called in to try and get them out of it. I mean, and I asked them, why did you do this? Oh, well, that's what the newspaper said. So this is the problem when somebody doesn't have a sophisticated team, a risk management. I mean, um, so you tend to find it with more of the larger banks than uh, you do with the smaller ones. Uh, one of the problems with relying on the media is over the last 10 years, they've either seen their senior staff retired or have been laid off. And when you have a bunch of kids running a newsroom, and not a lot of them, uh, they can't dig very deep, and they don't know what dark corners to dig in. So, yeah, uh, it's kind of a, a death spiral there on the media side. Do you think people are stupid enough to accept central bank digital currencies? I mean, I can't even believe that there that um, the people even proposing this. Are, are pretty stupid. I mean, but all they see, this is goes back to the career politician. They see us as the enemy. All right. And all we ever hear about is that, oh, there wouldn't be a problem if everybody paid their taxes. All right. So they want to go to this digital currency so that if you hire the 16 year old girl next door to be a babysitter, you know, while you and your wife go out, oh, well, where's our 50% from her? You know, um, it, it's it's getting crazy. I mean, I, I was actually shell-shocked myself here. Um, I was in a conversation with Australia. 
and people are actually proposing to confiscate everybody's wealth completely upon death. And you should not be allowed to, to give anything to your children. And everybody's children should start from zero. And all this money and wealth should go into a, a fund for uh, retirements. I, I mean, I was like, what? So in other words, every small business that's ever been created just shuts down and can't be continued. And they, they don't even look at this stuff. They, they have no idea of what, how the economy, you know, functions. Um, you take, you know, uh, Ford. So when he died, they should have just fired everybody and shut it all down. Um, it, it's, it, I don't know. I, I just, I can't imagine where these, uh, leftists are, uh, they have no experience in the economy whatsoever or even understanding humanity. What is your economic confidence model seeing and predicting? Basically, it's just showing that inflation is continuing into 2024, along with interest rates. Uh, after that, we're probably going into war. They need war at this stage in the game. And the plan is effectively to, to create another Brenton Woods too, where Europe will default on all its debts and, and most countries will probably follow. And then you move to this digital currency and the IMF is already out there uh, with its digital currency pushing that it should replace the dollar. Uh, this is really what they want. I mean, they think that um, that's how it worked the last time. So it, we need a war to justify another Bretton Woods, and that is the excuse for them to default. Uh, and sadly to say, you know, that what I've heard out of Washington is that they intend to try and, and create war before the 2024 election uh, because their theory is, well, no president has ever lost an election during war. So they think that will be the major thing for, for Biden to get reelected. Is Socrates seeing any panic cycles during the second half of this year? Uh, they're varied. I mean, we have uh, some panic cycles actually coming next week. Uh, and so you're getting some spikes up in, in, in the metals right now. And, um, you have, uh, the stock market coming back down. You have, we have panic cycles in Ukraine for next week. Uh, it, it just, it's very, very unsettling in a lot of different areas. Uh, the markets are trying to figure out which direction to go. So we're in a, this very choppy period right now. And then it looks like from August on, we're probably in risk of, of geopolitical events. Are gold and silver looking like sell in May and go away? Um, yeah, you're, you're probably back off, reform a low, and um, maybe going into a June low. Uh, June, July low, and then take off again. If they go up and make a high at that point, then you probably would come down into the summer and then take off. Uh, but, I mean, this is effectively the third time trying to get up here to uh, new record highs. And usually, you know, you'll back off a little bit in the fourth time you go through. Does Socrates see stock markets reaching new highs in the next year? And maybe describe what Socrates is. Um <clears throat> Well, Socrates is, is really the only fully functioning AI system, um, in the world, which is monitoring all the, the markets globally. It writes its own, you know, forecasting reports on over a thousand instruments every day. Um, it's not like the evil AI. It's own, it's confined to, um, the financial markets. That's it. it you know, it's not out there to, you know, um, create weapons and blow up society or something like that. But um, uh, that's pretty much what it does. And so it, it's really looking at how capital moves. And that's something that I I noticed when I was a hedge fund manager, like everybody was in, in Geneva during the 1980s, dealing with the OPEC money. Then it started moving to Japan. As the money flowed there, so did the talent. Then it went from there to Southeast Asia. Then from there, oh, everybody ran back to Europe for the euro. Um, 
I mean, these things tend to be very cyclical, and they, you know, um, get to, you know, people get together. Uh, I mean, I would recommend reading online uh, Herbert Hoover's memoirs, 1931. He was talking about the same thing, how capital acted like a loose cannon on the deck of a ship in a hurricane or something, shooting off in every which direction. He said we couldn't form a committee fast enough to figure out where, where it was going next. Uh, but that's what we're heading for. Um, higher volatility, uncertainty, and the capital is just going to move. I mean, we're dealing with the amount of money in sovereign debt is at least 10 times that of the stock market. And um, the stock market will eventually go up as the bond markets come down. The smart money is going to realize that the place not to be is in government you know, government instruments. I mean, they're going to default on this stuff anyhow. Besides just spending recklessly, um, they started with COVID, and they're, they're continuing with this Ukraine nonsense. What does Socrates see ahead for the U.S. dollar? Um, eventually, the capital will come over. Uh, as war begins, you'll see another wave that comes into the dollar, pushes the dollar up. But we're looking at probably the dollar ending its reserve currency by maybe around 27 to 2028. Uh, and But when you have Korea shooting missiles off over Tokyo, I mean, I speak to people in, in Japan, and they go, well, you know, maybe we should have some of our money over there in the States. I mean, that's just common sense. And and as I said, with World War One and World War Two, the money came to, to the United States, whereas before, you know, J.P. Morgan had to bail out the U.S., it was bankrupt in 1896. So things can change dramatically like that. For the rest of the year, does Socrates think commodities will be a good or bad place to be? Well, look, everything's going back and forth right now, but the trend is up into next year. The housing market seems to be getting a bit of a bounce this spring. Does Socrates see this as a turnaround or a so-called dead cat bounce? Uh, it depends where you're at. Um, uh, there's a a lot of migration from the higher taxed uh, cities of in the United States. You're seeing a massive uh, people just leaving New York, California, Illinois. Um, it's you know just just so you have a trend of internal migration, uh, which is quite extensive. So. Real estate's going down in those areas, and it's going up in areas like Florida, Texas, etc. I mean, I live in Florida, and honestly, I get at least two to three calls a week trying to buy my house. Any thoughts about doing that? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I say, where am I going to go? <laughs> the housing market seems to be, uh, like I said, a, a bit of a bounce. Because it's so uh, market-driven, is that going to change the way uh, the economy works in the U.S.? Well, even the IRS uh, has come out and shown that you're looking at massive uh, migration that's taken place so that the income from taxes in California, Illinois, New York is declining. So these cities, these states, you know, they don't reform. You know, their solution is raise more taxes. Uh, that's all they ever do. And... You know, eventually it just it, it goes bust. That's basically what the the normal situation is. I mean, you can even look at Rome. Uh, Rome had was the first city that ever reached you know million uh, people, and then as taxes rose, they left. Rome fell to fifteen thousand people, and it took until the Victorian age for a city to ever reach a million population again. Um, but that's why, you know, we had the feudal system. People just left the cities, moved to the suburbs. Um, that's where we even get the term suburbium was Latin. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's basically what what happens. I mean, these people in government never learn. And like I say, we we our downfall is it's career politicians. Uh, it was very nice. The founding fathers made the... Um, idea that the Congress uh, should only be there for two years. And they only 
they only basically got together for six weeks anyhow. Then they start paying themselves money, and then they became career politicians, and then they sit around, gee, I got nothing to do. Oh, well, maybe let me make a law on this, you know. And and then the problem when we have these career politicians is that they're so detached from society. When Obama put in the his health care, uh, I had Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And they called and they said, well, you know, we're going to have to cancel your policy. You're going to have to get a new one. I said, what's the problem? They said, well, you don't have maternity leave. I said, well, I don't think I'm going to get pregnant. <laughs> you know, you know, but this is the problem. I mean, yes, everybody would say a woman should be entitled to maternity leave. They put that in there without any age restrictions. My mother was in her 80s. Oh, she didn't have maternity leave. You had to change it. Yeah, what? I mean, um, this is the problem. You, you have 23-year-old kids writing laws that have no experience whatsoever. And then the other people, you know, there's these laws are, are I think Obamacare stood seven feet tall. Nobody's going to read it. So they just sign it. The same thing with the Patriot Act. I mean, I had put out a a a, a a blog post back then and saying, listen, um, you know, they've lowered it from 10,000 to 3,000. And one congressman I know, oh, that's not true. We didn't do that. And I said, really, did you ever read the Patriot Act that you signed for? And then I gave him the page number. <laughs> really? Yes, that was in there. Could we see a full downturn in the economy this fall? Uh, yes, the economy itself overall, because you're getting major shifts here. Um so, I mean, just, you know, the, the major cities like Fifth Avenue, New York, uh, other places, in the blue states in particular, uh, they were very draconian on COVID. And, you know, uh, at, at least a third of the stores never came back. You know, you go down Fifth Avenue and their stores boarded up. Uh, so you're looking at the economy clearly down in certain areas and up in other areas. Um, like around here in Florida, nothing but help wanted signs. Uh, but everybody's coming here. You go up to, to you know, you know, New Jersey, New York, and, you know, it, that's not the case. Could economic downturns be an opportunity for some people to get rich? Uh, yes. Look, if you understand the cycle, um, there's a time and place for everything. And... Uh, you know, I've bought real estate over my life using the cycle, and I wait for it to go down, and then I step in, and I've, I've bought things that have been, you know, they double in price very quickly. Um, I mean, the place I'm at in Florida, I mean, one guy, I said, listen, I, I, I said, I'm not interested in leaving, and I threw out a number. So I said, look, I wouldn't even sell it at, at five times what I paid. He goes, well, we could probably beat that. I said, no thanks. Goodbye. Because <laughs> it would cost six times to find a similar place, right? Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to go? I mean, you know, am I going to go to New York? No, thank you. Could we be in for a global economic collapse? Yes. You're looking at uh, economic declines quite significantly, particularly in Europe. Um Europe is, is probably the worst of all, uh, but, you know, they've had interest rates down for so long that, you know, for example, they don't understand this. They lower interest rates, oh, to get people to borrow. Well, what about you told people to save so you can retire and live off your savings, but then you take interest rates to negative, so then you're punishing those people to, to try and get somebody to borrow? Um they never look at there's two sides to everything and lowering the interest rates basically deprived uh, the elderly and retired even, you know, it really punched them. So you, you have complete diversity here. But um, Europe is, is probably the worst case scenario because you you ha went negative for 2014 and there isn't a government bond that is even a break even at this stage. And so you had pension funds by law had to buy this stuff. And, they're, you know, the pension funds are insolvent. What's happening in the automotive market? Uh, well, there too. I mean, uh, it's you have insane, you know, 
regulations here coming in with this climate change, which is also just really nonsense. If you just look at, I mean, ice core samples and have shown that, you know, um, the climate always changes. It's a cycle, like everything else, the seasons. All right. And, um, you know, moving to, you know, all electric cars or something like that, we don't have a power grid to even support it. But it's another classic example of those in power have no clue what they're doing, what they're doing at all. Uh, but used cars are up 23 to 25 percent. Um, cars are in shortages that way, and they're trying to put in all this nonsense of, of electric cars. And you even have Biden signing a thing that uh, that all tanks and everything have to be electric. Uh, what are you going to What are you going to do? Tell us uh, and war. Oh, hold on, when we got to plug in to charge up again. I don't know. I mean, it. it you got to be wondering, you know, if Dumb and Dumber wouldn't do a better job in running things. Our electric vehicles are growing trend in Florida. Um, I don't see very many here. No, um, uh, you know, I have a. I bought a hybrid from BMW, and then they stopped making them. Hmm. It was great. Never had to plug it in. Um, it was gas and electric, and it was. I thought that was the solution, but. Nope, they didn't like any gas at all. So it, I don't see anybody with it. I mean, I, I don't in Florida. I mean, if you got a hurricane coming and you got, you better hope your car's charged up, and you're not going to get more than you know a couple hundred miles away from it. Are we getting close to a time when so-called big toys will be able to be bought for pennies on the dollar? Uh, probably. I mean, we're just getting to the stage of all of this stuff. It's the drastic. Um, policies that are being implemented here uh, i mean I, I would say between the, you have this craziness with the climate change which is being used to uh, effectively try to change the entire world economy uh, outlawing things before they they have even uh, have any alternative I um, mean, you have New York that just outlawed gas stoves. I mean, I grew up with gas stoves and gas heat. It was, I think I survived. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, mean, I think we're, this is where we're heading, and there's always a good time to buy things. You can buy things cheap because of uh, such actions, and other times when everybody's all bullish about something, that's the time to sell. 15-minute cities and the climate change narrative. Do you think people will fall for it? You have a number of people that um, unfortunately listen to this stuff. Uh, they, they don't understand that no matter what it is, you cannot reduce everything to a single cause like CO2. Um, it's the same thing in the economy. It's never a single issue uh, like we were talking about with, with real estate. I mean, you have taxes migrating some people on one side. You have other people basically buying property uh, to hide, you know, to get money out of the government side. So you have a diversity of, of people acting for different reasons, but the net sum becomes the same. Should we be concerned about the push for 5G? It certainly seems to be. There's an, uh, a lot of, of evidence now coming out that people that living very close to it have uh, this, what they're calling a microwave syndrome, and it's not just people, but even their dogs. Government censorship is being pushed in a number of countries, including Canada in and the U.S. In Canada, there's talk of banning Fox News. Could this be the trigger that wakes people up to what's really going on? Look, this is the same thing that they did in the communist revolutions. Um, I went behind the Berlin Wall before it fell, uh, visited, went with a friend to visit his family that was trapped there. And when nobody was near us, his cousin, she would, you know, say the truth. But as soon as anybody was close, oh, this is the government. They take such wonderful care of us. And as soon as they would disappear, she'd call them every name in the book. I mean, this is what we're heading towards. I mean, I don't care if, if you agree with Fox or disagree. You have to, to, to basically say, I have to allow them to speak, otherwise I myself may not be able to speak. That's what this is about. Free speech means 
they should be allowed to say their side as well, uh, not just one side. And this is all propaganda, and it's typical of very left-wing communist-type agendas. They always do this, no matter what country you're looking at. The ancient Greeks had sophists, people who in the morning would speak on one side of an issue, they'd go for lunch, and then in the afternoon speak against it, and then they would say, you, the people, decide. Is, is that what we're going to miss here when they start censoring things? Yes. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's they want to put their agenda through at all costs, period. Um, <clears throat> and they don't want any dissent. This is not democracy. It's not freedom. It's, it's basically authoritarian rule. That's it. And <clears throat> to have governments even doing this it shows you that they are not fit to basically be a government anymore. Martin, where can people follow you? Uh, well, we're basically on the <clears throat> armstrongeconomics.com until they basically nuke the, the Internet and won't allow people <laughs> to even see that anymore. Uh, but uh, it's free. You don't even have to register. Uh, we believe in freedom, and you can just go in and look at it that we don't even sell advertising. Martin, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. My guest has been Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics. You can find him online at armstrongeconomics.com. He was speaking to us from Florida. Coming up, Victor Adair, next on This Week in Money. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Victor Adair, recently retired from nearly 50 years of being in the brokerage business in British Columbia, but still very active in the markets. He's speaking to us from Parksville, which is on Vancouver Island, a beautiful place to be any time of the year, but especially, I think, in the spring, just as things uh, liven up. Victor, welcome back to This Week in Money. Jim, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Before discussing individual markets, what are your thoughts on the macro landscape? Um, let's see. Well, I think the macro landscape, uh, the key thing is probably inflation, you know, and what the central banks are going to do about it and, you know, the consequences of inflation and the consequences of what the central banks uh, are doing. So, you know, let's look at that. Uh, we had the better part of two decades uh, without really much in the way of inflation. Let's say certainly the last decade, broad CPI numbers in the States anyway, for that market in Canada, pretty much the same, kind of sat around 2%. And uh, then, you know, that changed. And we had a, a few things, but let's say COVID sparked uh, a few things. And one of the things that sparked was, you know, central banks became uh, very easy with their monetary policy. Governments around the world figured out different ways to shove money out into the, the system, as it were, give people free money so they'd spend it and, and keep the economy going. And uh, then, you know, we had the, the supply chain issues, just if we could leave it at that. And that those those three things, I think, contributed to, uh, let's call it inflation, uh, I would say maybe with uh, the the money printing, as it were. No, let, let's not call it money printing. Let's say that the shoving of money by the governments into people's hands uh, was maybe the major lasting contributor to inflation. But certainly, you know, I mean, we had things like lumber prices spike because the mills weren't sawing wood. And I mean, they I think what lumber prices went up about four times what they had been. You know, supply chain issues. Those were 
transitory to some degree. And, of course, the chairman of the Federal Reserve got roasted so badly for using the word transitory. He probably wish he'd never done that. But anyway, we had inflation come along. The central banks seem to be slow to react, perhaps because they really believed it was just brief supply chain issues. And we've seen a lot of those supply chain issues have really corrected. I mean, I used to see scary charts on how freight rates around the world had just gone through the roof. Well, they've now come back to where they were before COVID even happened. Some of them are cheaper than what they used to be. So they were right in that. But we got this inflation thing happening. Central banks like to correct it. And the only thing they could really do was to raise interest rates and to tighten other monetary policies. And then the consequences of that, I've been talking about this for some time, you know, what are the consequences if you have an environment where interest rates have been near zero and, you know, people who lend money have been handing it out willy-nilly and everybody and his dog has borrowed money and suddenly interest rates go a lot higher, you know, so we have some stress. And uh, at let's say at some level, uh, that stress has shown up with uh, different bank failures, if that's not too strong of a word, in the United States and Switzerland. Uh, and the question might be, you know, um, who's next in terms of succumbing to this? Uh, I think everybody is seeing the commercial real estate market highly levered usually. And, you know, they borrowed a lot of money when money was cheap and now they need to refinance when money's much more expensive and maybe not even available to some of them because their, their business plans, you know, don't make sense. So it seems as though we've had this to and fro in a in a, an emotional way in the market as to you know whether we're all going to hell in a handbasket or you know the central banks will uh, sort it out and we'll we'll be okay. So I know <laughs> if you got an economist talking, his, his view of uh, the macro environment would be I'm sure different than mine and probably much more sophisticated. But as a trader, when I look at how markets are responding, you know that's kind of what I see as the macro environment. And of course just occurred to me i left out something very important and that was you know the russians invaded ukraine and that set up all kinds of other issues as well so and and in some respects that may have been uh just adding to stress that was already there because of changes in monetary and fiscal policy the daily charts of the major stock market indices have gone sideways in a narrow range for the past six weeks from a longer term perspective the Dow has traded mostly inside a 2,000-point range for the past year. What would it take for the markets to break out of these ranges? Well, to put that in perspective, you know, we had a, a bull market in stocks. Let's call it the stock indice. That lasted for 40 years. I mean, it started in 1982, uh, you know, and that was coming off a time when interest rates were very high. A, a lot of old timers will remember, you know, 20% interest rates or certainly 15% interest rates and how a lot of people struggled with that in the day. Uh, and then interest rates fell for, you know, the next 40 years. So the, the lowest interest rates in, let's say, 5,000 years happened in, in August of, of 2020 after, you know, those really high numbers we had in the early 80s. So you had this 40 year bull market in stocks. I mean, with some interruptions along the way, for sure. In 1987 certainly comes to mind when the Dow fell 25% in a day. And then, you know, in the early 2000s, we had some uh, bear markets as well. But certainly, and COVID, COVID gave us a shock. But after COVID, you know, then the market just kind of had the run for the roses, particularly in some issues. You know, people were buying stocks that were going to benefit from everybody being locked up at home. You know, things like Peloton went to the moon and, and so on. But the stock market, basically the major indices anyway, peaked out in late 2021, beginning of 2022. And I think what was happening, again, in a big picture way of looking at it, is the market was expecting, with the inflation that was happening, that the central banks would start to raise interest rates. And it was kind of like, hey, we've had a great run. You know, let's take some money off the table. And certainly there was rotation from different parts of the markets that had been strong that weakened and other parts, you know, picked up. But that um, that really showed up in the American stock market. And the American stock market, you got to remember, represents about two thirds 
of the market capitalization of the global stock market. So, you know, everything from, you know, Britain to China to Argentina. So, uh, that was the high with the expectation that interest rates were going to start to rise. And they did. And maybe more aggressively than people thought. So the market came off of the highs and maybe, uh, then we started to go sideways, as you say, for the last year or so. And I think the mindset of a lot of participants, uh, particularly people who would be passively investing in the market, that is just, you know, putting money into the market every month, regardless of what the price is, because they have been told by their advisors that over the long period of time, uh, you know, the stock market generally goes up. So if you try to time it, you're just, you know, you're, you're foolish. Just keep putting money into the stock market. And by the time you retire, you know, you'll, you'll be well ahead. So the, the mindset there, I think, was if the, the, the magic moment is going to be, you know, when the Fed stops raising rates, that's going to be the green light special because then, you know, we've, we've, we've been struggling because rates have been going up. So if rates start to fall, then we won't be struggling anymore. We'll be uh, getting back into the party. Um, However, you know, the inflation has been sticky. You know, the Fed is probably, and the other central banks as well, is probably surprised that inflation hasn't come down more. And they're, they're not, certainly the, the talk this past week from the European Central Bank, from the Bank of Canada, and from the Federal Reserve basically was, we are determined to get inflation down. Do not expect us to be cutting rates anytime soon. Now, the market, of course, is pricing in uh, that the Fed will be cutting rates in the second half of this year. So then you get maybe get to a point where you be careful what you ask for. Why would they be cutting rates? It's not because inflation is going to be back down to 2%. It's probably the market's thinking something, you know, something bad is going to happen. You know, maybe, you know, the banking crisis gets much worse. Maybe there's other people out there that, that struggle from trying to refinance at much higher interest rates. It would seem, let's call it in a nutshell, something breaks would probably what would precipitate a, a, a decline in interest rates or a sharp decline in interest rates as we go into the second half of this year. Um, the labor market they say, has been so strong, uh, roughly speaking, that in the G7 countries, unemployment is at a 50-year low. And that is giving people, workers, you know, the, the money, the income to go out and pay the higher prices of everything, uh, even though people are well aware that the purchasing power of their money, whichever currency you're in, it is going down. So, so we've got that, I think, is a, is a factor in the market as to where to go, um, and, you know, inflation protection, certainly, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about the gold market, but, you know, I think some of the buying in gold has been people concerned about the diminishing purchasing power of their currencies. But I think you could also look at the stock market as a, as a, a good uh, hedge against inflation. Trouble is, the stock market is not monolithic. Uh, we've got seven or ten thereabouts, you know, big cap tech stocks, which really are the market these days. And those big cap tech stocks are trading at a multiple of about 30 times with uh, the rest of the other 490 stocks in the S&P 500 trading at a multiple of about 16. So the market's kind of been back and forth here. I think, uh, you know, depending on your time frame, day to day, the market's gone back to fo- back and forth. Over the past year, it's kind of gone back and forth as we've got these conflicting forces, bullish and bearish, that are uh, pushing the market and there hasn't been, you know, a clear winner, let's say, that would take the market either sharply lower or sharply higher. You were bullish on the U.S. dollar for all of 2021, most of 2022, but changed your mind last fall. The U.S. dollar index has fallen about 15% since its 20-year highs made last October. It's been going sideways in a narrow range the past six weeks. What do you see the greenback doing now? Well, it's something the same as as the stock market in terms of, um, let's say, going sideways. Uh, there are these forces that are impacting sentiment and and the reality there. Uh, let's again maybe back up a bit. The U.S. dollar had hit a three-year low back in January of uh, 2021, and really, 
you know, it was like more like a, a seven-year low, but it was act really just a three-year low. And then it started the rally, but the rally really wasn't a barn burner. Uh, the rally didn't really pick up any momentum until the fall of uh, 2021. And remember just a few minutes ago, I was saying, I thought, that, you know, the stock market kind of peaked out at the, in the fall of 2021 and started to fall. And that's when the U.S. dollar started to accelerate to the upside. And it was a common theme there. Uh, higher interest rates for the U.S. dollar. And the, I think the Fed was perceived to be much more aggressive with monetary policy than any of the other central banks. So, uh, in a way, you know, that, that put a, put that the afterburners on, on the rally for the U.S. dollar. Um, the dollar then made a 20 year high in September of last year. And just to put it, that in perspective, on the other side of the dollar, you might remember around that time, they were having a real crisis uh, in the credit markets in the UK. The pound was at a 37-year low against the US dollar. Japan, the yen was at a 32-year low. So in a way, in September of last year, the US dollar may have run too far too fast. And other central banks were obviously starting to not, not so much catch up, but say mimic to some degree what the Fed was doing. In other words, cranking up interest rates to try to cool inflation. And uh, I think maybe one other thing, so I don't forget it, that accelerated the rally was certainly the flight to safety uh, in the U.S. dollar with the war in Ukraine. You know, that gave a, certainly gave a bid to the U.S. dollar and a goal at the same time. That, that often happens in a geopolitical crisis. Now, um, recently there's been, I call them stories, just to put a word on it, about the U.S. dollar losing its reserve status. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've traded currencies certainly since the 70s, and these stories come around from time to time. I would say my short and sweet about that is the U.S. dollar will still be seen as a safe haven relative to other currencies. Uh, you know, don't don't bet the farm on the U.S. dollar losing its reserve status, particularly if uh, the, the world becomes a, a dodgier, trickier place, you know, the, the U.S. dollar will catch a bit. Where does it go short term? You know, um, I don't know. I'm looking at it, uh, and I definitely trade different currencies, and I definitely make trades in different markets because of what I see going on with the U.S. dollar. I am, uh, I haven't done much, I guess maybe the last couple of weeks, maybe a month or so anyway, uh, given that as you say, it's just sort of gone sideways. I'm really looking at the, the euro, uh, in my blog, I've re frequently referred to the euro as the anti-dollar. Uh, anybody that wants to bet against the euro, you know, uh, the, uh, bet against the US dollar, pardon me, sort of the first place you go is you buy the euro, you know, then alternately you could buy, you know, the Swiss franc or the Canadian dollar or whatever, but, you know, the, the euro, and particularly in the positioning that I can see in the market, that you know, get these reports as to who's who owns what, and uh, the speculators of different types are are heavily uh, long the euro against the U.S. dollar, and I keep thinking to myself, well, okay, I get that. You know, the the American stock market, for instance, outperformed the European stock market for well more than a decade, and in some respects, with the U.S. dollar so rich last fall uh the u.s dollar started to fall just about exactly the same time when the major european stock indices started to rally and you could just picture that capital was moving away from america into what were perceived to be the cheaper assets outside of america and that, you know maybe the place that got the most capital flow was going to be europe you know there'd be more money go to europe than say go to india uh, in the stock market so um you know the market has these ups and downs and you know i guess i'm looking at the euro and thinking i think it's looking tired but i i haven't been a buyer uh, of the us dollar against the euro yet i'm kind of sitting on my hands here but that would probably be my next trade would be to be a buyer on the buy side of the U.S. dollar rather than looking to sell it. The Canadian dollar has traded inside a three cent range since last September. Do you see that changing? Um, yeah, Canada has traded, I guess, between about seventy two cents and seventy five cents. It's almost since uh, you know, is it? It's I was going to say a year, but I guess it's not quite that long. But and it just kind of oscillated up and down. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we've talked before about what are the correlations that Canada has. And maybe if I could just do a sidebar, I am really big on paying attention to correlations. And uh, the, <laughs> the ironic thing about correlations is that sort of just when you got one identified, then, you know, the correlation shifts. But I'm always looking at how one market will affect another. And I, I used to... When, do public speaking, I'd describe it this way. I said, you know, picture some guy in the soybean pit in Chicago. You know, that's his main business. He's, in fact, maybe that's the only thing he's doing is he trades soybeans. But I'm going to tell you, he's going to constantly be looking over his shoulder at the big board to see what's going on in the metals markets and the energy markets, in the currency markets and the interest rate markets, because in some different ways, these markets are always interconnected and when the when the connection goes out of whack you have to say why is that and if you can find that out that may help you find a trade and then you know you say will the correlation come back again so with canada uh one of the strongest correlations is uh you know we're talking about canada against the u.s dollar is if the u.s dollar is going up against most currencies in the world it's probably also going up against the canadian dollar it's just that simple. And of course, there's going to be times when it doesn't work, but there's that. If the commodity market, let's say take a 20-year sweep of time, if the commodity market is in a bull trend, the Canadian dollar is probably in a bull trend. And uh, uh, then maybe on a shorter term basis, and this one's twists around and gets a little more choppy, but the correlation between the Canadian dollar and the American stock market. And the American stock market, I just use it as a surrogate for risk-on, risk-off sentiment. And just this, at the end of this week, um, well, let's go earlier in the week, the sentiment in the U.S. stock market was kind of negative. People were panicking a bit, I think, about, you know, is this banking crisis getting out of hand? So the stock market was going down, the Canadian dollar was going down. At the end of this week, uh, it, we kind of had a turnaround in the stock market, uh, largely, I have to say, because Apple was just fantastic in terms of beating all of their uh, expectations when they released their quarterly reports. And uh, if I could do a sidebar on that one, I mean, Apple, <laughs> this is just amazing. Uh, they are so huge. Uh, they uh, they announced that they would do a ninety billion dollar share buyback, and I had to go look this up. But eighty percent of the stocks that are listed in the S and P five hundred have a total market capital capitalization of less than ninety billion dollars. In other words, you know <laughs> uh, it, the, that. Um, Apple is planning on giving cash out by buying back their own shares to the equivalent of the size of 80% of any one of the 80% of the companies that uh, are in the S&P. So, uh, yeah, the stock market at the end of this week was buoyant and the Canadian dollar was buoyant. Uh, also, I think helping the Canada, we had uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada was doing a speech on Thursday, I guess it was. And he made it clear again, listen, you know, we're going to fight inflation. We we can't let this get out of hand and uh, don't expect us to be cutting interest rates anytime soon. So, and one final thing on that positioning, uh, I know again, because I can see the data that the speculators have been heavily short the Canadian dollar. And if the Canadian dollar starts to rally, those guys get a little nervous and start covering some of their positions. So, uh, where do we go from here on Canada? It's going to just depend on like where where we get the breakouts in the other markets. If the stock market gets the shakes again and goes down, uh, that will be a, a risk off event. That's you know bullish to the U.S. dollar generally. So you know in that kind of an environment, the Canadian dollar would very likely be falling. I'll be um, I'll be I'm open either way. I've traded Canada from both sides here the past uh, month or so. The the, the it's it's been an almost uh, an alternative way to trade the stock market with less volatility. Mm. I've been trading yeah. the Canada that way. So anyway, a, re- a recession in the United States, uh, which would bleed into Canada. Uh, Canada would weaken the employment data we had out of Canada and the United States on Friday was much stronger than expected, and I think that also helped put a bit in Canada. So you know, these are some of the things I pay attention to when I'm when I'm trading that. Gold briefly traded at new all-time highs this week. Why did that happen? And is gold now in a bull market? Uh, 
Well, let's see. Gold, um, I told, uh, mentioned that um, the U.S. dollar hit a 20-year high at the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, and the, the euro then started the rally. Uh, so the U.S. dollar was falling against uh, a number of, of currencies. Gold uh, rallied a little bit, but didn't get off the ground. But gold then really started to go to up, started the rally at the beginning of November. And uh, since then, until the highs we had this week, it rallied about $400, so let's say 25%. Uh, and the rally has built on itself over that period of time. There was uh, news out, uh, t- like certainly uh, toward the end of last year and very early this year, about how much gold central banks were owning up to having bought. Uh, when I say owning up, uh, usually the central banks in Russia and uh, China are rather tight-lipped about uh, what they're doing on the gold account. But, uh, you know, that that was bullish for gold. The fact that the U.S. dollar was falling uh, was bullish for gold. Uh, the fact that people are aware that the purchasing power of their currencies, again, whatever currency they're in, uh, has been declining and gold has been going up against it, virtually all currencies. So I think uh, people were buying gold as a defense against depreciating currencies. And then uh, this week, uh, yeah, we had a run for the roses. Uh, as I said, early in the week, the market was panicking a bit about whether or not the banking crisis was just going to get out of hand. Uh, I think those worries were overdone, but you know, you never know. So, uh, and, and that I think gave us the, the pop on, uh, what was it Wednesday? It was Thursday that we made the high. Uh, also following the FOMC meeting on Wednesday, you know, uh, the, the, I think the market took it that the Fed was now going to pause. You know, they've raised rates. But they're going to keep them higher for longer, but they're not going to put them any higher. Now, some of that thinking uh, was reversed when we had the very strong employment numbers on Friday. So, yeah, the gold market, it hit, like, very briefly. I'm talking two minutes. We traded up to $2,085 and then kind of came back down again. And that was late Wednesday afternoon. Uh, by Friday's lows, the gold price had dropped $80. So it, the swings are going to be more dramatic here. The open interest, the, the total number of people who have positions on in the futures markets, or I should say the size of the positions everybody in aggregate has on, has uh, risen sharply the last two months. Uh, I can see that showing up to some degree also in the uh, gold ETF data. So uh, what I would say is retail has come piling into the gold market here in the last two months. And I think guys that are, you know, selling gold coins and that sort of thing, bars uh, over the counter would uh, would confirm that there's been much more retail activity on the buy side. So, um, yeah, I think those are the, the spike, to the all-time highs at 20 80 uh, was on the, the bank worries and uh, then the reversal here when uh, the, the unemployment data was so strong, the, the chances are that the Fed is going to stay higher for the longer than the market had been counting on. WTI oil prices jumped about five bucks overnight after OPEC Plus announced production cuts at the end of March, but prices are now below where they were before the OPEC announcement. What are your thoughts on oil? Yeah, that was uh, that was a real surprise in the oil market. It, like uh, a, a number of other markets, uh, as we've discussed here, had been going in a sideways range, you know, t- swinging up and down for a few months. And um, over a weekend, OPEC, uh, I think, surprised the market. Although you know, <laughs> I hate to, well, you have to be cynical if you're going to be a trader, and yeah, you, you know, you can't you can't be depressed about that. But the the Saudis made the announcement, I think it was a Sunday, our time, and uh, late Thursday and Friday, oil prices, before the announcement, oil prices got bit higher. Maybe somebody knew something, you know, who knows, maybe it was coincidence. 
I, I don't think so. Um, the Saudis did surprise the market, though, broadly, and you're right. Uh, when trading opened on that Sunday afternoon, we were $5 higher on WTI, and the market bid uh, a little higher after that. But then, interestingly enough, the rally kind of petered out and came back down again. Now, there'd be two things here. One was positioning, and uh, again, by able being able to see how different players in the market were positioned, we could see there was a substantial speculative short position uh, in crude oil before the Saudi announcement. So those guys may have been scrambling to buy when the market opened $5 against them. You know, that's one of the reasons I think some people, certainly short-term traders, just like to be flat over the weekend because if Usually, if you get a surprise, it happens over a weekend, and with the markets closed, there's nothing you can do about it until you know everybody and his dog knows about it before the market opens, and you get these gaps, like a $5 gap. I mean, that's $5,000 per contract, which is an unpleasant surprise for anybody that would have been short. Anyway, the market uh, was goosed up, and then it seemed that some of those, uh, call it trend followers, uh, reversed from being short to being long and as the market started to back up here uh they were they were seller turned sellers i would have to say that um uh, let's say that's enough about positioning uh, b- believe me when i look at taking a trade in the market the most important question to me is not you know the story about you know why i should be buying this or selling that it's uh, i'm thinking How's the market already positioned? I, I'm not the first guy who figured this out or who heard this or whatever. Uh, and so I, I really pay attention to positioning. And I, what that would mean is if the market's been, is running aggressively higher, say like the gold market did, I am not interested in being a buyer because I would call that chasing it. And I just, I, I'm not, by chasing something, I diminish my, uh, ability to to manage my risk as well as I can if I don't chase a market. So sometimes you just have to say, hey, I missed it. So to come back to crude, the other side of it is the fundamentals, and we have the data that the demand in the United States for gasoline and for diesel is running several percentage points below the average of the demand in, the say, the 2017 to 19 period of time. So why is that? Uh, well, you know, it's interesting here. Uh, a few months ago, diesel was in breathlessly short supply. You know, you had to sneak some in from Russia or India or wherever they got it from. And, you know, the, there was going to be freight trucks pulled over at the side of the road because they'd run out of fuel and on and on. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. The last three months or so, the, the diesel market has been really weak. So obviously the the supply demand picture changed there. I see some of the reports from the freight companies that are saying business is horrible. So maybe that's why the demand wasn't there. Whatever, uh, we've had the price uh, drop. Um, you know, just uh, again another sidebar. You know, the, the sanctions that were imposed on Russia so that we would bankrupt them so that they couldn't execute the war in Ukraine clearly didn't work. I mean, it's one of the things about oil, and you can go back to, I remember the days back in the late 70s, I guess it was, early 80s, Mark Rich, you know, uh, was was moving oil around and he, where he should have been, and uh, he had to run and go hide in Switzerland when the American authorities came after him. Oil will find a way, you know, these, these markets uh, are, are, are fungible in that respect. I mean, I see India, for instance, uh, two years ago was getting Virtually no oil from Russia. Now, 30% of the oil that they use is coming from Russia. You know, and they've got this ghost fleet of ships that's moving oil around and ship to ship transfers, you know, in the dark of night offshore. And, you know, the oil will find a way. There's, there's so much money involved. It, it, it's kind of, what can you say? You know, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad that the folks that put the sanctions in place thought that was going to have any effect. Um, I would also point out uh, Exxon, you know, the world's uh, largest uh, uh, publicly traded oil company. Well, maybe uh, Aramco is publicly traded. But but anyway, uh, Exxon, their share prices traded at an all-time high 
at the end of April. That was up about 400% from where the prices were back in 2020 when they were politely booted out of the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Index. So, you know, probably some probably some wry smiles around the boardroom table at, at Exxon as that happened. So I've been r- mumbling here. I, I probably didn't get around to answering your question. I'm sorry. But, but there's just there's so much going on in the in the uh, energy markets. The broad commodity indices tumbled to a 20-year low when COVID hit the world economy in the spring of 2020. Prices then tripled over the next two years, peaking out after Russia invaded Ukraine. The indices are now down about 30% from last year's highs. Is the great bull market in commodities over, or has the decline of the past nine months just been a correction? Well, <clears throat> I guess if I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Uh, the commodity, the broad market, and first of all, most of the commodity indices uh, are heavily weighted with energy products. So certainly the, the Goldman Sachs one is, and that's the one we a lot of us look at. So, you know, sort of as as crude oil goes, so goes the indice. And I say that because, um, I mean, you remember local people in British Columbia would certainly remember this, uh, lumber prices just spiked like crazy, uh, in the, the summer of 2020 when, um, COVID hit, you know, the, it seemed as though the mills weren't cutting wood and there was none available. And at the other end, there was suddenly a demand, particularly in the States for wood or two befores in particular to, to, to build, uh, houses. And, uh, I see, uh, right now, even though we've had this very sharp decline, uh, since the Russian invasion, which was the peak of the commodity indices, uh, live cattle and tell people if you're buying steak down at the Safeway, you know this, live cattle and also orange juice, <laughs> or which don't seem to have much correlation one with the other, but they're both trading at all-time highs, even though you know the, the broad commodity indices is down here. Sugar prices are, are I think, close to all-time highs. So we've got th- these baskets of commodities uh, that are dominated by crude oil, and the fact that crude oil is down maybe you know hides the fact a little bit that live cattle, orange juice, and sugar are, are all doing really well. Uh, uh, another example here of the ebb and flows of these markets when um let's see after the U- russians invaded ukraine by about may the economist magazine ran a cover and they they are famous for picking tops and bottoms of markets uh, by error <laughs> anyway the the cover had a, a sheaf of uh, wheat on it and the story that was tied to the cover was with wheat prices at all-time highs. You know, people were going to starve to death because food inflation was so strong. You know, fertilizer was either outrageously expensive or just plain unavailable, and so on and so on and so on. Well, <clears throat> wheat prices are now down about 60% from where they were at that high. Uh I guess what I'm trying, the point I want to make here is that the commodity markets have these uh, wild swings and that they're not all the same. Some things are going up and other things are going down. So when people see commodities, say, as an asset class, as a, as an alternative to stocks and bonds and real estate and what have you, uh, it, it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty motley correction uh, of, of what's in the commodities. Is the great commodity bull market over? You know, there's so many stories out there, and I, I say stories with a skeptical tone because I've just heard stories all my trading career. And, you know, one of the current ones is that the demand for copper is going to be so strong, you know, the price is going to go to the moon because we're going to make, uh, you know, electric cars, and we're going to have to have transmission cables and so on and so on and just the electrification of the world is going to you know take more copper than you could shake a stick at and it takes forever to get a new mine uh, into production if you could even find one so therefore blah 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 well you know it's a great story and and copper really you know it's gone up but it hasn't gone up a lot and another story and this one is so believable is that with the population growth the way it is that the rest of the world is going to want to live the good life like, you know, we live in the West, and that means energy demand is going to go crazy. Well, 
you know, uh, when's it going to start? You know, it, yes, it's a good story, but you, I, I don't trade on stories is what I'm saying. So whether or not the great bull market in commodities is over or not, I, I have no idea. Uh, I'll, I'll just trade things kind of day to day as I go along and, and, and be very susceptible. Uh, or, I Pardon me, skeptical. Uh, if somebody tells me that, you know, such and such is going to go to the moon because of such and such. You've been a trader for more than 50 years. You worked in the commodity and stock brokerage business for over 40 years. What advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out as a trader? Well, don't believe stories. <laughs> but I think I made that point. Um, well, it's way harder than you think, and and it's also way easier. Uh, I know I, I usually write a piece every week. I call it Thoughts on Trading. And one of the things I was saying was uh, about... Um, well, you know, the, the people who I have met, and there's a few, and then there's people that I know about, and there's a lot more of them, who have done really well at trading. In other words, you know, they made a lot of money, are as different from one another as chalk is from cheese. You know, that it's somehow you find a way that suits you, suits your personality, suits your skill set, suits your upbringing, your risk tolerance, and on and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, the guys that find that, uh, and nobody finds it, you know, just coming out of the gate. Some guys maybe don't find it until they're older, a lot older. And other guys, you know, get on the bandwagon and, and run with something, and then, you know, the world changes or they change, and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, generically, um, you need to, this would be my, uh, here, I'll, I'll tell a personal story. When I was in my 30s, I traded very aggressively. I would usually have on margin requirements in the, for the positions I had that were well in excess of the money in my account or maybe even my net worth. It was just the kind of that, the mindset when I was in my 30s back in the 80s was you want to try to turn $10,000 into a million as quickly as possible. And that's what the commodity markets were for with all the leverage that we had. And uh, a lot of guys... Way more guys, let's say, got carried out. Uh, that's the term we would use. We lost all their money, uh, than, than, you know, made a fortune. When you read books about guys that made a fortune, yeah, for every one of those guys, there's, you know, another 600 guys that, that didn't do very well. So, um, you need to protect your capital, uh, so that you can live to play another day. And your capital is not only the money in your account, but your psychological capital, uh, I know guys who have taken their own lives because they were taking too much risk with the trading. They did. Uh, and I, that maybe is a bummer to hear, but let me tell you, it happens. You know, there's, there could be enormous stress. So these days, the best advice of, you know, my, my son's a trader. He worked with me for 10 years and now he's off doing his own business. You know, some of the things I would tell him would be, you know, you, you got to, Know where you're going to get out before you get in and, you know, manage your risk and trade smaller size. Get smaller, get smaller. You know, if you get, if you can learn to trade with a small amount of money, then when you have more money, you, you know, you've got something to, to build on. But if you take your bit of money and just throw it into the machine and it's gone, you know, you haven't learned anything and you're probably angry. So yeah, you know, take it easy. Take your time. Understand that you got to roll with the punches. Um, uh, I would say understand you're going to lose and be wrong more than you're comfortable with, and you got to be able to live with that. Uh, so, you know, uh, I guess one of the cliches is it's a, it's a grind, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, that sort of thing. So that kind of advice. Don't look to get rich quick. Victor, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Jim, it's always a pleasure to Pleasure to be with you on the show. Thank you for having me on. My guest has been Victor Adair, recently retired from nearly 50 years of being in the brokerage business in British Columbia. Check out his website, victoradair.ca. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Martin Armstrong, and Victor Adair. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests or the show, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. 
archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.